here we are again undertaking another step towards Lent another step in our pre-Lenten preparation as I tried to convey last time we saw each other I believe that uh, we really need to take seriously this time of preparation which somehow has the same length in terms of the weeks that we uh, go through the same length, uh, length as the Holy Fast itself so we fast for five weeks and we have five Sundays of Lent and we have five Sundays before Lent by which we are supposed to get ready to get prepared for the Lenten journey and as I pointed out last time what we uh, learned so far is that our preparation has well let's call it a social dimension it has to do with how we behave towards one another and we've seen uh, a number of examples both by way of the apostolic readings uh, and the gospel passages examples of misbehavior on the part of people who otherwise might be virtuous persons uh, they might be truly and the Lord doesn't ever say in, in the gospel that those people were not virtuous people they would uh, uh, fulfill the commandments uh, they will pay their dues uh, they will uh, fast they will pray and so on and so forth but there is like a string connecting these examples from the righteous people of Jericho to the Pharisee uh, that uh, uh, condemns the tax collector while he prays in the temple to uh, the eldest son of the father who had two sons the eldest son who uh, condemns his younger brother who went away and returned home and the eldest son convinced of his own righteousness could not cope with the idea that his younger brother was back and his father instead of punishing him flogging him crucifying him, uh, him or, 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 or things like that he invited people and uh, organized a banquet on the other hand we have this other example this other kind of people who really have a problem and they know it Zacchaeus the tax collector of Jericho knows in the presence of the Lord he realizes that he is a sinner that he uh, is a robber a thief uh, that he despoiled uh, innocent people of their uh, uh, goods of their means and he repents he, he returns then we have another tax collector in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in the presence of, uh, of God in the temple this sinner the tax collector is able to realize his failures to acknowledge them before God and ask for God's mercy and then we have the prodigal son the young son of the two uh, uh, of the two who uh, requests that his father gives him uh, whatever was due uh, to him in terms of uh, in inheritance uh, goes to a distant land and there he uh, uh, well, wastes his fortune his wealth giving to all those around him giving generously perhaps unwisely but generously to all who were around him and the young son now left bereft of friends because he no longer had any material means to keep the friends around him realizes that uh, it would be better if he returned home to his father and he does that 
like the tax collector in the temple, humbly. I will go back to my father and I will say, look, I, 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 I was wrong. I was wrong. Receive me back, please. Accept me back, not as your son. Accept me back like one of your uh, hired hands, one of, of your servants. And for his humility, his father receives him back. And we see uh, all the signs of, uh, let's call it, reception, uh, an honorable reception upon his return. He receives a ring that shows the covenant be the, between uh, himself and the father. He receives uh, sandals because he was barefoot. He receives sandals, which means what? Now he walks on the path of righteousness and he receives back his former glorious vestments. Now, in, in many English translations, uh, we say that he receives back uh, or he receives from the Father uh, the best robes. But it's not the best robes, it's the first robes that he had before he left. So, through repentance, the young son, upon his return, receives whatever he had before he left. Either way, we have therefore two kinds of people, and we need to be prepared. That's part of our pre Lenten preparation, so that we know how to fast. What is the goal of fasting? The goal of, of fasting is not uh, to learn uh, the best uh, of uh, fasting recipes, you know, so that we trick uh, actually the, the fasting part, you know. When you, you, you put uh, into uh, fasting food, not fast food, uh, fasting food, so much effort, you are so refined in cooking fasting food, well, that's no longer fasting. Fasting means simplicity. Eat less, eat worse. Yeah. So Lent is not about changing diet. Fast is about undertaking all this process of, well, let's call it change, renewal, transformation. On the one hand, through getting thinner by eating less. On the other hand, yep, yeah, that's the idea, getting thinner by eating less. On the other hand, by changing our outlook, by changing our mentality uh, first of all that requires from us to recognize who we really are what kind of people are we are we uh, on the path of righteousness but we haven't discovered love for people and compassion uh, are we virtuous persons but we judge others for their failures or are we uh, like tax collector and the prodigal son and so on and so forth who uh, really have a problem and, and now they realize that they have a problem and they return and they should return and we all should return. So these are uh, aspects that we need to consider in all seriousness so that uh, now that uh, we are getting so close to uh, the fasting time, the Holy and Great Lent, we know the purposes of fasting. The purposes of fasting aren't just uh, to change diet. The purposes of fasting uh, are to undertake this kind of spiritual exercise, questioning our uh, prejudice, our preconceived ideas, uh, putting some big question marks uh, in relation to how we think and how we live and how we behave in relation to our neighbor. That's the idea. All these Sundays teach us this richness of approaches, so to speak, in relation to uh, our transformation during Lent. And we shouldn't take this uh, you know, superficially uh, lightheartedly, no, it's serious stuff and we need to consider it seriously. Now, uh, this uh, 
whatever number it is, 34 Sunday after Pentecost, we read two passages that uh, sort of shift the focus. It's still a social dimension to uh, the message of this Sunday, but the focus is somehow changed. It's not about uh, sinners who return through repentance, through conversion, and it's not about uh, uh, righteous persons who uh, do not love others and are judgmental and condemn their neighbor. No, this is a very different story. And this is where I invite you to barge in and uh, have your say. Uh, what's the story? Uh, you can begin with whatever passage you like. Is it the gospel passage from Matthew? Is it uh, from St. Paul's uh, letter to first letter to Corinthians? Which one would you, uh, would you like to summarize? Enthusiasm is overwhelming. Hmm? I'll start with the gospel passage. Please. So it's about you know what uh, what do we have to kind of in, do to inherit eternal life and you know in Jesus we're told that you know it's um, it's in the things we do here in terms of how we serve others and see others so and it's often in those that are um, most marginalized and disadvantaged it's how we serve those um, because when we serve those we're also serving Christ himself yeah and actually there is a connection right at this juncture between this passage in the gospel and the apostolic uh, passage where we see the same idea somehow if we serve uh, our uh, sisters and brothers who are weak in, in the faith, if we have understanding and we minister to them, we actually minister to the Lord. That's what St. Paul says. So it's the same idea repeated in different terms. Okay, so, and what do we learn from, from this gospel of the so-called final judgment? What, what is actually, the, what is the Lord teaching, teaching us actually through, through this identification between himself and the marginal? the persecuted, the forgotten, and so on and so forth. I, I think it's also partly linked to the themes of the previous Sunday where um, a change in ourselves also leads a change in how we see others and our neighbours. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not just changing myself. Changing myself results in, in other things. Yeah. And, and it has this practical embodiment, you know. Yeah. Uh, how do I actually behave in relation to my neighbor? It's it's like, you know, we, we live like uh, and walk like blindfolded. Yeah? Imagine uh, a street, a crowded street, there's people coming and going and stuff like that, you know. Uh, and imagine all of them blindfolded, not seeing each other. That's actually what what happens we move through life as though we are blindfolded we don't see each other we don't see each other especially in this kind of culture which is very self-centered you know that that's the value the self and we live as though as though we are blindfolded as though we are alone in the world you know there's that movie, The Last Man on Earth or The Last Woman on, on Earth and stuff like that. And th that's how we behave. And this preparatory time that introduces us to the Lenten story invites us to well, open up our eyes, our minds, our hearts to realize that we aren't alone, that there's people all around us and, and that we need to do something about people, you know. We can minister to people in a variety of ways. The Lord gives us here very practical examples. It's nothing about philosophy, you know. Uh, okay, pray for you, but I can give a damn on you uh, and stuff like that. You know? Sorry to be so blunt, but that's how things go. It's actually when, when you know that your neighbor is in a tight spot 
and you do something for your neighbor. That, that, that's what the Lord wants us to do, you know. Look, I love humankind, but I hate people. But I don't care about people. You can't love humankind and don't and not care about people. Real people. Yeah. And the Lord says, okay. Uh, he actually, yeah, you did it. You didn't even know that you were doing it, but you were you were doing it, and, and you were serving not only them, you were serving me, because I identify myself with these uh, least, as the text says, the least brothers and sisters, like in the parable of the prodigal son, you know, from a certain viewpoint. Uh, he identifies himself with the story of the prodigal son. He is the youngest son, you know, and so on and so forth. But that's another story, but let's leave it for some other time. Uh, and the Lord praises those who, even without knowing it, even without knowing that that's his commandment, love one another the way I have loved you, and yeah, that's the commandment. Yeah? Even without knowing that that's the commandment, and there's no other expectation from us, those people had the initiative and they loved one another and they loved people and they loved people in very concrete ways. They saw a homeless person and, and they at least smiled to show that that person is a person and that, that we weren't blindfolded when we passed by. And we saw that someone was in a tight spot and we did something for that person. And of course, I, um, prayer is important, but there are other ways in which we can do it. And the Lord is not the invisible Lord of the Old Testament. The Lord is the visible God incarnate. He could have saved us from above, you know, sending a thunderbolt, that's my preferred solution for many things on earth the thunderbolt to get rid of us or some other form of salvation from above some decrees forgiveness and stuff like that no the Lord wanted to come in our midst to descend in our midst and live the way we live to get born uh, the way we uh, we are born uh, to uh, grow up and uh, change teeth and uh, lose teeth and uh, get hungry and uh, get some food in and get thirsty and drink some water or wine or whatever was there available if it wasn't available he would change it of course into something better but he did all this because he wanted us to understand that theory isn't sufficient theory should descend in praxis in a way of life and we should embody the gospel of love in acts of love, of compassion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the gospel also teaches that some people fail at the text. They, uh, they would expect to see Jesus behind uh, uh, every, every downtrodden, every marginalized, every forgotten in the world, so that the Lord gives them a sign that He is there, and therefore they have to do something, and they have to do something. And that, that's what, how I read the last bit of the, of the Gospel reading. Um, Lord, we haven't seen you anywhere. If we saw you, we definitely would have done something for you. But that's not the point. The point is, open up your uh, eyes and see that there's people all around you and I'm with them. If, if the people uh, aren't so important to you, then know that I'm with them. And therefore, serving them, you serve me. Yeah. Social lessons. Now, we, we can't be disembodied uh, idealists. Uh, that's not Christianity. Of course, it's important to know the gospel because without knowing the gospel, without knowing the commandment of love, we'll never know what we are supposed to do in relation to our neighbor. 
sometimes it seems humanity is so thin that we cannot recognize it in our neighbor. We need God to come down from heaven and tell us what humanity is and who people are so that we can see them and do something about it. Okay. Um, but what's the bottom line here is that we will never be judged by God for ideologies, for ideas. You know? And we transform everything, including Orthodox, including the Gospel. We transform everything in ideology when we don't do anything to embody that knowledge into a way of life. Yeah. There's a slightly different story in uh, the Apostolic Passage from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, it's still the same uh, dimension, social dimension, but uh, considered through a slightly different lens. It's a matter of uh, what we do when we see people around us and we see that their faith isn't so strong. Do we shock them? Do we ignore them? Or we do what the Lord himself has done when he came down from heaven to become one of us. What does that mean that the Lord came down from heaven to become one of us? He treated us from the viewpoint of where we are at. You know? He didn't ask us, didn't ask us to uh, elevate ourselves, to lift up ourselves uh, above all condition. He came down to us, embracing our condition so that he can talk to us there where he found us. It's the same with St. Paul here. St. Paul says, well, uh, in the church there are many voices in the church there are many people different kind of people they, they have different visions they have different understandings of their faith different lifestyles they are all god's people but they are different no one can uh, eradicate diversity from within the church from within god's people and we need to be mindful of it and treat people accordingly not According to, I don't know what standard, idealistic standard, they aren't all the same. Some are uh, stronger in faith, others are weaker in faith. Those who are weak um, take everything literally. If it says 40 days uh, no meat, 40 days no meat. And if I see someone uh, 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 taking a candy from someone uh, or uh, whew, pouring some milk in their coffee, it's the end of the world. Well, there's people who believe that that's the case. That's their faith. That's their worldview. But what's wrong is when someone, whether uh, in the category of strong or in the category of uh, weak, impose on the other group their views. That's problematic say St. Paul it's not what the Lord has done towards us and with us and in relation to us the Lord came down from heaven to live the way we are the way we live not imposing his standards on us so we should learn from the Lord who is next to each and every one of us to serve people the way he serves all of us and that's the way of Lent, and that's the way of the Christian life. And that's what we are supposed to uh, take at heart in order to continue our Lenten journey and our Christian excursion through life. May we all walk as uh, the Gospel teaches, loving one another, recognizing the humanity in all people irrespective of who they are and may we all find ourselves and one another in that blessed group of uh, christ's believers who will receive the blessing of eternal life and joy uh, without end amen